Welcome to the History Obscura Reading Room. I am your host, Mandy Gardner. And if you don't already have a cup of steaming hot tea and perhaps a nice thick slice of chocolate cake, I suggest you get one ready. It's time for your bedtime story. But first, settle in. Are you ready? Good. Once upon a time, on Easter Island, a Dutchman by the name of Jacob Rajivine arrived by boat in the year 1722. It was Easter Day. Rajivine called himself an explorer, but the isolated community of Rapa Nui did not understand this word, or indeed anything the strange man said for that matter. The visitor was treated with respect, despite this communicative problem, and therefore Rajavin was allowed to explore the 164 square kilometer island for himself. The home of the Rapa Nui did not exist on any European maps, and so it was important to Rajavin and his crew to document its location and any discernible data for posterity. They found very little to report, however, aside from the presence of the Rapa Nui people on what otherwise seemed to be a wasteland. In the Dutchman's own words, translated of course, the discovery was reported as follows. We originally, from a further distance, have considered the said Easter Island as sandy. The reason for that is this, that we counted as sand the withered grass, hay, or other scorched and burnt vegetation because its wasted appearance could give no other impression than of a singular poverty and barrenness. In truth, the landscape was that of a dry grassland home to a sparse number of trees and bushes, none exceeding ten feet in height. In fact, only two species of tree and two species of shrub could be found. The fauna of the exotic island was much in the same shape, existing solely of insects and domestic chickens. There were no wild animals, no vegetation to forage, and very little firewood to keep the residents warm throughout the cold, damp winter seasons. The most striking feature of the entire landscape was clearly man-made, that is, the estimated 900 gigantic stone statues. These ornamented the coastline and peppered inland quarry sites. The stones were called moai, carved between the year 1200 and 1500 by the Rapa Nui. Up to nearly 10 meters in height, these statues averaged some 5 metric tons in weight. Most of that weight and size was taken up by an oversized human head, while the rest showcased a diminutive body consisting of arms, torso, and upper legs. When buried in the soil along the coast, many appeared only to be enormous heads with coral irises and obsidian pupils. All of these heads faced inland, putting the backs of the statues towards the ocean. Their ears were long and their noses quite pronounced. Each statue represented a once-living ancestor of the people still residing on Easter Island, or as they called it, of course, Rapa Nui. Said Jacob Rajavin, The stone images at first caused us to be struck with astonishment because we could not comprehend how it was possible that these people who are devoid of heavy, thick timber for making any machines, as well as strong ropes, nevertheless had been able to erect such images. 
They also lacked vehicles, wheels, and any heavy animals to help with the transportation of those massive sculptures from quarry to resting place. Furthermore, the people who Rajameen met on Easter Island nearly 300 years ago had only what the explorer described as bad and frail canoes, which did not explain how they had come to live there in the first place. The people themselves lived in caves, which made up one of the largest inhabited underground areas in the world. Stretched end to end, these caves would reach 10 kilometers in length. On the walls of these caves, you can still make out drawings of the local birdmen. Birdmen were so titled after winning annual competitions to collect the first sooty tern egg from the inlet of Motu Nui, swim back to Rapa Nui, and then climb the sea cliff of Rano Kau to the village of Orongo. Word of Easter Island's existence spread quickly, and many more explorers came to visit over the following decades. Fifty-two years after Rajaveen's landing at the island, Englishman James Cook arrived to see it for himself. Along for the voyage was a traveler from nearby Tahiti, who found that he could speak with the estimated 2,000 inhabitants in his own native Polynesian tongue. It was clear then that the Rapa Nui were descended from a Polynesian tribe and therefore a nation of world-famous seafarers and warriors. So how had they become an isolated community of struggling farmers on a wasted landscape with only shoddy canoes that could barely take them far enough into the ocean to fish? It seems that a once thriving local economy, based on clear-cutting the land for yam farming, rendered the landscape barren and empty in just a few short centuries. According to the Rapa Nui, their ancestral king, Hotu Matua, lived in a beautiful continent called Hiva. One night in his dream, the king received a message that his land would sink and that he needed to find a place to take his people. Following a wise seer's advice, Hotu Matua sent seven explorers towards the morning sun in search of a favorable land to live and grow yams. After several days of sailing, the seven explorers arrived on a small and uninhabited island that seemed fertile enough to live on. It is said that besides yams, the explorers took a moai with them and a mother-of-pearl necklace and left this abandoned when they returned to Hiva, leaving behind on the island only a single explorer. Hotu Matua soon arrived himself on the island with two great ships, bringing with him his wife, his sister, and another 100 people. Since then, the people called the island Te Pito o Te Henua, which means the world's navel. Moai of those seven explorers were erected at one of the island's main urban sites called Ahu Akivi. These are the only statues that face outward towards the sea. These sites were built to specific specifications according to the astrological calendar. The Moai platform, in Akivi is oriented from north to south so that the faces of the Moai look towards the setting sun of the equinox of the Austral Spring every September 21st. Their backs face the rising sun of the autumn equinox every March 21st. Another Rapa Nui myth describes the arrival of a second group of immigrants following the Polynesian settlement of the island. 
These people are said to have been a wide race with long ears, as opposed to the Polynesians' self-styled thin race or short ears. Some anthropologists suggested that perhaps the second wave of settlement came to the island via Mexico or South America, particularly given the long, stretched earlobes of the Inca from those areas. For hundreds of years, it was largely believed that no such journey could have been possible during the 12th century, when South American cultures used simple canoes and rafts for seafaring ventures. So, in 1947, a Norwegian explorer and ethnographer named Thor Heyerdahl decided to prove once and for all whether that second wave of immigration, and perhaps trade, was indeed possible. Thor and five other archaeological explorers constructed a raft whose design was based on illustrations of Inca rafts drawn by Spanish conquistadors in the 16th century. It featured a mainsail and a small cabin. The raft, which Thor and his friends named Contiki, successfully sailed from Peru to the Tuamoto Islands in French Polynesia, proving the viability of such a craft over a distance of 8,000 kilometers. The journey took 101 days, and during the more than three months at sea, Thor and his fellow sailors noticed that an abundance of fish gathered between the balsa wood planks of the raft providing a reasonably reliable source of food. Having served its purpose very well, the Contiki promptly smashed into the coral reef at the Tuamoto Island chain on August 7, 1947. Today, there are about 7,750 people on the island of Rapa Nui, which is officially a part of Chile. About 45% of these inhabitants consider themselves to be descended from the Rapa Nui, and they still distinguish themselves as belonging to either the Long Ears or Small Ears people. Isn't that precious? That's how my cats distinguish amongst themselves as well. The Mexicans with the long skinny tails and the Canadians who are rather chubby and full of fur. Ha. Ah. Thanks for joining me once again, friends. And thank you so much for listening to my novel chapter yesterday. I really appreciate it. As always, you can support the podcast through patreon.com forward slash history obscura. Good night. Mm-hmm.